Hello, I am the Nerdy Apologist, and on this channel we use the tools of faith and reason to come to a knowledge of the truth. This video is part of a video series I am doing on Christian apologetics, so if you have not seen the previous videos, please check those out before continuing with this one. Thus far, we have established that God exists, that Jesus existed, that the Gospels are authentic, and that their texts were reliably preserved. However, just because the Gospels were transmitted accurately does not mean that they are historically reliable documents. Proving that is the goal of this video. A lot of skeptics try to dismiss the Gospels as recording myths, and thus we shouldn't take them any more seriously than we'd take the Iliad. Internal evidence, however, strongly suggests that the evangelists were trying to report history. Take the beginning of Luke's Gospel, for example. Inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things which have been accomplished among us, just as they were delivered to us by those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word, it seemed good to me also, having followed all things closely for some time past, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, that you may know the truth concerning the things of which you have been informed. Here, Luke clearly states that he's trying to write history, and that he's based his gospel on eyewitness testimony. Later in his gospel, Luke writes, In the fifteenth year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea, and Herod being tetrarch of Galilee, and his brother Philip tetrarch of the region of Etureia and Trachonitis, and Licinius tetrarch of Abilene, and the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John the son of Zechariah in the wilderness. This style of writing is much closer to what we find in ancient accounts of history, and would seem very out of place if the Gospels are supposed to be myth. The other Gospels don't have this type of explicit historical language, but they are still consistent with the genre of Greco-Roman biography, which is indicated by their openings, their primary emphasis on Jesus, their chronological and narrative structures, and their emphasis on the end of Jesus' life, which was common in ancient biographies. For more information, please check the link in the description. It was internal clues like these that eventually led C.S. Lewis, a man fascinated by mythology, to write, I was now too experienced in literary criticism to regard the Gospels as myths. They had not the mythical taste. So the Gospels were certainly written with the intention to accurately record Jesus' life. However, were they able to do so? It is a fact that the Gospels were transmitted orally before being written down and many people have expressed skepticism of the ability of the Gospel authors to accurately remember everything that Jesus said. This objection stems from a lack of familiarity with ancient oral cultures. Back then, having a good memory was seen as very important, much more than it is today, and children were trained to have a good memory. Dr. Craig Blomberg, when interviewed by Lee Strobel for The Case for Christ, states, Rabbis became famous for having the entire Old Testament committed to memory. So it would have been well within the capability of Jesus' disciples to have committed much more to memory than appears in all four Gospels put together, and to have passed it along accurately. It is difficult for us to imagine today, but this was an oral culture, in which there was great emphasis placed on memorization. And remember that 80 to 90 percent of Jesus' words were originally in poetic form. This doesn't mean stuff that rhymes, but it has a meter, balanced lines, parallelism, and so forth and this would have great, created a great memory help. The other thing that needs to be said is that the definition of memorization was more flexible back then. In studies of cultures with oral traditions, there was freedom to vary how much of the story was told in any given occasion. However, there were always points that were unalterable, and the community had the right to intervene and correct the storyteller if he erred on those important points of the story. If you recall from my last video, I responded to an objection that said that the textual transmission of the New Testament was like playing telephone, and I said that the game doesn't even accurately represent the oral transmission of the Gospel. Blomberg goes on to comment, When you're carefully memorizing something and taking care not to pass it along until you're sure you've got it right, you're doing something very different from playing the game of telephone. If you wanted to develop that analogy in light of the checks and balances of the first century community, You'd have to say that every third person, out loud in a very clear voice, would have to ask the first person, do I still have it right? And change it if he didn't. So the disciples were clearly able to remember the sayings of Jesus. However, some skeptics still try to say that we can't trust what was written because the disciples made up sayings about him. Does this objection hold water? No, it does not. To understand why, let's look at the first major controversy in the church, the Judaizer controversy. 
When Christianity first started to spread among Gentiles, there was a question about whether these Gentiles needed to become Jews before they could become Christians. That is, did they need to be circumcised, keep Jewish dietary laws, and observe Jewish feasts? If ever there were a convenient time for the apostles to make up sayings about Jesus, this would have been it. Yet they didn't. In the Gospels, you will find a remarkable absence of Jesus discussing this topic. In fact, some of Jesus' sayings could be used to support the opposite of what the church decided. Acts 15 records that the apostles ruled that Gentiles do not need to observe the Jewish law to become Christians. Yet Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law and the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot, will pass from the law until all is accomplished. The fact that what Jesus says here seems to contradict what the apostles ruled is evidence that the apostles didn't feel free to make up sayings about Jesus. There's also the fact that the Gospels record some embarrassing details. For example, Jesus is recorded as being baptized even though baptism is for the forgiveness of sins. Peter denies Jesus, most of the disciples abandon Jesus at his crucifixion, and they don't understand why he has to die until after his resurrection. And let's not forget the hard sayings of Jesus like the command to eat his flesh and drink his blood, or the call to carry your cross daily, or the command to love Jesus more than your family. If I wanted to start a religion, these are not the types of things I would make up. In addition to all of the embarrassing details, there's also corroborating evidence outside of the Gospels. I've discussed much of this in a previous video, but there's some more that I want to discuss here. First, let's discuss the crucifixion darkness. Matthew, Mark, and Luke agree that there was an unusual darkness on the day of Jesus' crucifixion. As it turns out, other ancient historians also reference this darkness. Julius Africanus, who lived during the 3rd century, mentions how the Roman historian Thallus, who wrote in the year AD 52, mentioned the darkness. Thallus, in the third book of his histories, explains away the darkness as an eclipse of the sun, unreasonably as it seems to me. Paul Meyer, a scholar who specialized in studying Pontius Pilate, also wrote, This phenomenon evidently was visible in Rome, Athens, and other Mediterranean cities. According to Tertullian, it was a cosmic or world event. Phlegon, a Greek author from Caria, writing a chronology soon after 137 AD, reported that in the fourth year of the 202nd Olympiad, i.e. 33 AD, there was the greatest eclipse of the sun, and that it became night at the sixth hour of the day, i.e. noon, so that stars appeared even in the heavens. There was a great earthquake in Bithynia, and many things were overturned in Nicaea. Speaking of earthquakes, there is also geological evidence of an earthquake occurring in the region of Palestine between the years 26 and 36 AD, which seems to corroborate the Gospel of Matthew, which records an earthquake after Jesus' crucifixion. There are two other things relating to the crucifixion in the Gospels that also serve as evidence that they're accurate. First, in Luke's account of Jesus' agony in the Garden of Gethsemane, we read, And being in an agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat became like great drops of blood falling it down upon the ground. Sweating blood under stress is a known, albeit very rare, phenomenon called hematidrosis. Interestingly, it is most common among death row inmates. It seems very improbable that Luke would make this up considering how unknown this condition was at the time. Second, in John's account of the crucifixion, we read, One of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once there came out blood and water. This, like Luke's claim about Jesus sweating blood, seems very extraordinary. Why did water also come out of Jesus' side? Once again, modern medicine is able to explain this. Jesus would have experienced a large amount of blood loss during his crucifixion, which would have resulted in the collection of a lot of clear fluid around his heart and lungs, which would have come out of Jesus' side. Again, this is not something John would have been likely to make up, especially because he, unlike Luke, was not a doctor. As Lee Strobel explains in The Case for Christ, John probably had no idea why he saw both blood and a clear fluid come out. Certainly that's not what an untrained person like him would have anticipated. Yet John's description is consistent with what modern medicine would ha expect to have happened. This would seem to give credibility to John being an eyewitness. Additionally, there are several other pieces of archaeological evidence that support the Gospels. For example, Luke has been shown to be a remarkably accurate historian. At the beginning of Luke 3, he calls Lysanias Tetrarch of Abilene. This was widely regarded as an error on Luke's part, until archaeologists found an inscription that agrees with Luke. 
Also in Act 17, Luke calls the rulers of Thessalonica Polytarchs, which was also regarded as an error until an inscription was found proving him right. Over and over again, Luke has been shown to be accurate. Now, there is still one issue that troubles scholars, and that is the census in Luke 2. This census is said to have taken place while Quirinius was governor of Syria, but Quirinius was not governor of Syria until almost a decade after Herod the Great died. However, this can be resolved by noting that the passage can also be interpreted as saying that the census happened before Quirinius was governor. For more information on the census, check the links in the description. Archaeology has also confirmed what is found in John's Gospel. Archaeologists have found the Pool of Bethesda, the Pool of Siloam, and Jacob's Well, all of which are mentioned in John, and they are consistent with John's descriptions. Contrast this level of evidence with the Book of Mormon, which mentions several pre-Columbian cities, people, and civilizations in the Americas, none of which has ever been found. The Book of Mormon is what happens when someone just makes stuff up. The Gospels are what happens when people report things reliably, as we have seen. Finally, I want to talk about one more thing related to the reliability of the Gospels, and that is undesigned coincidences. An undesigned coincidence is when one account has secondary details that explains another account in a way that does not appear to be contrived. Now, the case for the Gospels from undesigned coincidences is a cumulative case, meaning that it is based off of multiple examples. For the sake of time, however, I will only give one example, and I have linked in the description a couple of lectures from Tim and Lydia McGrew about this. The example I want to give concerns the story of the feeding of the 5,000. This is the only story outside of the Passion narrative that appears in all four Gospels, and naturally there are many undesigned coincidences. In Mark's account we read, And Jesus said to them, Come away by yourselves to a lonely place and rest a while. For there were many coming and going, and they had no leisure even to eat. And later on, Jesus commanded them all to sit down by companies on the green grass. This raises two questions. Why were there so many people, and why was the grass green? Well, John's account says, Now the Passover, the feast of the Jews, was at hand. This answers both questions. Jews from all over the Roman Empire would visit Jerusalem during Passover, which explains why it was so crowded. Also, Passover is in the spring, which explains why there was green grass, something that you don't see very often in the Holy Land. Now the next verse says, Jesus said to Philip, How are we to buy bread so that these people may eat? Now, why is Jesus asking Philip? Well, in Luke's Gospel we read, Jesus took the apostles and withdrew apart to a city called Bethsaida. Luke gives the location of the miracle, which the other Gospels don't. Later on in John's Gospel we read, some Greeks came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee. So that's why Jesus asked Philip. They were in Philip's hometown. Again, this is only one example, and if you want to see others, please check out the link in the description. So that's all for this video. Please don't forget to like, subscribe, and share it. My next video will be about whether the Gospels portray Jesus as God. I hope to see you all again, and God bless.